Hi, my name is Steve Rahi. I am a Premier Field Engineer specializing in System Center Technologies. Today's discussion is part 20 of an ongoing series dealing with Operating System Deployment Feature of Configuration Manager 2012. Today's discussion is specifically focusing on some automation and customization type scenarios that you can do with OSD. So, big topic. A uh, lot of different directions we can take this thing. Really just want to try to scratch the surface of this a bit. And do some demonstrations, maybe get some thinking started about what's possible, uh, and so on. So that said, here's uh, the agenda that I want to approach, you know, talking about uh, what I call beyond the GUI, whether we use the GUI, whether we use uh, standard steps, that kind of thing. Hit on PowerShell, some of the things we can do there. Uh, the idea of parent and child task sequences with task sequences in quotes there. Uh, the concept of providing imaging as a service wrap up with uh, with a discussion that we've probably mentioned before in this series. I can't remember, but it's called the sweet spot of imaging. We'll talk about that uh, in a minute. So it's kind of a building approach, actually. So if you look at this, the the more the most complex one of these is is down here that that has a couple of layers on it. But either way, we'll get there. So beyond the GUI. Right, so we've talked a lot in this series about task sequences, about the steps that are in task sequences, about how task sequences run, and the phases, and Windows PE, and the Windows OS, and, and different things. Right? So there comes a point at which, uh, as we get more advanced, the question might come up, should we use, should, should I use an inbuilt task sequence step versus uh, trying to do something totally custom. And I've seen it work both ways. Certainly OSD is very powerful, uh, provides you the building blocks you need to do very sophisticated imaging. But sometimes you can actually get into scenarios that we don't exactly address with our inbuilt task sequence steps. Or maybe it's more efficient for a given scenario to kind of build your own. Right? So don't do that as a first blush, you know, for sure, because you do want to have a good amount of experience with task sequencing before you possibly go down that route. But it is a valid question to ask at some point. So do we go custom or do we use default? So as a way to, to kind of illustrate that, I want to pull in the lab and, and show a couple of, uh, of demos uh, that I have here, or at least one demo that I have here. So I've got a, a just a standard Windows 8.1 uh, task sequence, uh, deploying Windows 8.1. And you'll see that I have mostly the default steps in here, and that's cool, right? So so one of the first questions that comes up is, what kind of steps might I consider valid or might, might be considered valid for full customization? Uh, what kind of steps maybe should we stay away from, right? And the answer is, you could build all of this by yourself. We've already talked about how to use DISM. We've talked about how to uh, capture whims and apply whims without task sequencing and, and different things. Point is, is it worth the effort, right? And so whenever I ask that question, a couple of steps come to mind. One is just the apply OS image task sequence step right down here, right? Certainly you could do this and use DISM and different things, but there's, in a lot of these steps, there's things that are happening behind the scenes that may not be obvious just by the name of the step. Certainly this is one, right? Uh, there's all sorts of things that we can do with the unattend file and the sysprep answer file and, and different things. Frankly, things that you could do yourself, right? But, uh, but there are complexities that, that makes it lend itself to using what's, what we have inbuilt. There's other steps in here that might make sense just to uh, do your own thing in some cases, right? So this is just applying a data whim. Taking a whim and dropping it onto a disk that you've provisioned, but you don't expect uh, to have it bootable, that kind of thing. You could do that. You could use our step. You know, we provide you a lot of flexibility in here uh, to use our step quite effectively uh, without having to bake your own, and that's cool. And then the last one that I'll talk about is this one, Set Up Windows and Config Manager. This is one that if you've ever paid attention to imaging, you know it's not a short-term process to work through this step. In fact, there's a, a reboot in the middle of it and different things, right? Uh, it doesn't just install the Config Manager client. There's a lot of behind-the-scenes work 
and manipulating, uh, saving data to the disk before the reboot and triggering the reboot and, and on we go. So this is one doesn't make a ton of sense to cut, to try to customize, probably wouldn't get it right anyway, if you tried, right? But there are some pieces that it does make sense in some scenarios to, uh, to customize. And one of them is partitioning and formatting the hard disk, right? Uh, so we certainly give you great flexibility in terms of partitioning and formatting the hard disk. You see the inbuilt st uh, steps there to be able to handle that. Uh, in this case, I've got them grayed out because I'm not going to use them. But, but great flexibility to be able to pick the disk, partition it the way you want, so on. But what about the scenario where you might have five or six different types of hardware that you want to build? All of them have maybe different disk sizes and, and based on corporate needs or business needs, you want to carve up different partition sizes based on the size of the disk. Right? Well, you can certainly do that in one of these uh, inbuilt steps. You could just uh, do a detection. You could add a condition to look in WMI and learn what the size of the disk is. And if it's a certain size, then you could run uh, a step to partition it the way you want to. At the end of the day, you might have you know, seven or eight steps in a task sequence and you only execute one of them based on logic, right? That's doable and I would not discourage that. It's a very good way, very effective way to be able to do this. But at the same time, it could be that maybe you want to just have one step and kind of grow this on your own. And that's what I've done here. So you see again, I've got my uh, default steps for uh, partitioning grayed out, right? They're not there. And I'm actually going to do partitioning myself. And so Let's walk through that. Specifically, there's there's three steps that I want to uh, want to do, and that one's grayed out too. That's just one I was using for test. There's three steps I want to do in order to enable me to run a PowerShell script. One is I'm just going to map a drive. You could do this a couple of different ways. I'm doing it this way because it's convenient. I'm mapping a drive to where my PowerShell script is going to be located. Then I'm going to run that PowerShell script. Now, you notice I'm using a run command line up. Uh, option here to call that PowerShell script from the command line. You don't have to do that. You could use the inbuilt PowerShell uh, script here, uh, run PowerShell script command, uh, it put it in a package and that kind of thing. Just didn't want to have to worry about that uh, for my example, but it's certainly possible. And then that process, there's a little bit of, of time it's not huge, but a little bit of time that it takes to run this thing. So I want to make sure the task sequence pauses before it moves on to the uh, add operating system or apply operating system, because if the disks are not ready, then this step will fail because there's no place to load the operating system. So I'm just putting in a sleep command for 15 seconds. Once the script runs, I'm pausing an additional 15 seconds, make sure it's all ready, and off we go. Right? This is what I'm using for partitioning. Now, uh, the script itself that's handling the partitioning, let's go look at that. So here is that script. This is very simple, but hopefully gives some ideas. So the first thing I'm doing is I'm going to query the Win32 disk drive uh, object stored into a variable. Right? And then I'm going to, and you may have you know, more than one disk, and if so, you'll need more logic than this in the script, and that's cool, it's easily done, uh, but I just have one. So then I'm just checking if the size is less than this value, then I want to write out a certain kind of disk part partitioning script. If it's other, if it's greater than this value, then I'm going to write out another one. The only thing that's different between these two sections is here. In fact, I probably could be more efficient. I know I could by writing the disk part components, just having one section that writes the disk part components and then have a, a, a difference here for the delta. Whatever. I just put this together quickly. You can do it, uh, whatever makes sense. And then once you have it written out, just start the process, call disk part, and pass in the script. So I'm going to store the script on the X drive, the WinPE uh, disk that's created. Right? So this is easy. It handles t really uh, either it's this, less than this, or it's greater than this, and so on. It could be that you have more logic you need to handle than this. Maybe it is. Probably it is. Right? But at least it illustrates the concept. So that said, let's actually go watch it run. Uh, so I'm going to pull in my one of my machines here. This is just a bare metal machine that I'll pull in. It's actually got a small disk partition, small meaning 
and it's going to fall into that first uh, condition. So I'm going to boot from that DVD and let it go do its thing. All right, so we've got uh, we've got that up and going. So I'm just going to step through, pick the task sequence that I want. It's going to be the custom one. Off we go. You'll see that Windows PE pops up, and uh, I'm sorry that that the DOS window pops up, and then um, we run the uh, step to run run this part like we see right now. So the disk is being partitioned, and uh, and we're good. So we'll let it finish up here, and uh, then we'll move on to the next part of this discussion. Cool. So now the partitioning's done. Now I'm into the wait step for the uh, for the 15 seconds, and then we'll go on and finish up and, and start to apply OS. So here we go. We're applying the operating system, and we're good. All right, cool. So I will close out of this and close out of this, pull the lab back out, and, uh, and, and we'll go on. All right, good enough. So PowerShell. It's kind of hard to get into any real discussion about automation without getting into a discussion of PowerShell. And so there's uh, kind of some questions about what, what really can you do with PowerShell, with automation of config manager imaging uh, and, and such. And the answer is it really... Uh, there's really a couple of places where this comes into play, right? So we've talked about, if we, if you reflect back on session uh, 15 in this series, we did talk about an example of using PowerShell inside Windows PE during imaging. And then we didn't talk about an example of it, but there's also the concept of using PowerShell in the imaging process whenever you're inside the running operating system. And the options are different between both, right? So in Windows PE, so in either case, in during imaging, during the, the image deployment process, in either case, you do not have the specific config manager commandlets available to you locally. Locally is key. In Windows PE, uh, you're limited also because some of the more advanced, uh, at least at the time of this recording, some of the more advanced remoting capabilities in uh, PowerShell are not workable in Windows PE version of PowerShell. And so you're left with some of the legacy uh, remoting opportunities that would you know, work on such, such command lists like a git wmi object and specifying the computer name and so on. You can still do plenty of things that you need to get done with that type of PowerShell uh, remoting, but it's just a little bit uh, more challenging to write the PowerShell because you don't have some command lists that would make it easier. Right? So why would you need to do remoting in Windows PE? So if you'll recall back in that example, uh, while we were in Windows PE in that example, we were uh, wanting to connect with the config manager server and add variables and uh, maybe move machines around in collections and, and so on. Things that you would want to do prior to a task sequence starting. So in the, the case of the example, it was a pre-start command, which happens in PE. Could be some other things you want to do in PE phase of imaging. Uh, point is, you're not going to be able to leverage the config manager commandlets uh, for specifically OSD in that phase of imaging. Once you get past PE and boot into Windows, then it would be possible to use the more advanced style remoting. Probably still don't want to take the time to import the module for config manager that gives you direct access to these uh, commandlets, but you can certainly use remoting to load that module on the config manager server side and make use of it, right, to do whatever you need to get done. So uh, that's why I said you, you're not going to have it locally, even in a running Windows, uh, whenever you're imaging, but you can certainly leverage it with, with PowerShell remoting. So what would you want to do maybe during the Windows phase of imaging? Well, one very clear example would be perhaps at the end of the task sequence, you want to programmatically remove the system that just completed imaging from the collection. Very common thing, fairly common thing, right? That you can use with PowerShell remoting and using some of these command lists down here. Uh, remove uh, CM, uh, well, there's no CM device. Well, this is just uh, all the OSD stuff, but there is a, an equivalent remove CM device from collection, I think is what it's called. All right. So that's, 
during the imaging process. But And, and these are the commandlets that uh, I pulled out just quickly, probably missed some, uh, that are specifically related to imaging, uh, uh, the imaging process. Some of it you may not want to do during imaging. Some of these things you may want to do external to imaging, which raises the third question. What kind of imaging operations would be uh, imaging-related commandlet uh, type operations would be interesting outside of a true imaging process. So that gets into a discussion of some things that we've talked about before and then an example of, of some uh, some new things. So so the thing that we've talked about before in this series is, and I won't even pull it up here just to show it, is the idea of a web page, right? So keep this one in mind as we move along and talk about the imaging as a service topic here in just a minute. But the concept here is that we would build a web page or a SharePoint form or an HTA or something like that that would give the ability for users or for field technicians or for uh, even you know, OSD administrators to have an interface that is not the Configuration Manager console to go and configure imaging options. Uh, the web page in this case would present the full array of imaging options that you want to allow in your organization and then users can pick and choose what they need accordingly. Or maybe you, you know, put some uh, defaults in there based on the, the particular business group of users and whatever, right? The sky's the limit, you're designing it yourself. And then the commandlets, the Config Manager commandlets PowerShell could be very easily and effectively used to pass variables, for example, uh, to a computer object or a collection object uh, to di di uh, dictate how the flow of imaging will work for the system being configured. Right? You'll actually see the OSD web page uh, here in a bit and such. It's actually built, the one in, in the example I will show is built on... VB, uh, if I were to build it today, I would use PowerShell, hands down, right? All right, what else might you want to do? Well, I could go on and on and on with the examples, but uh, another example might be manipulating your boot image. So let me pull that example in just a minute. So here's just an example of a script that I borrowed from one of my colleagues, Frank Rojas, uh, who, uh, very much active in the imaging uh, community, wrote to, to manipulate a boot image, right? In this case, it's a Windows 10 boot image, and there's some reasons why with uh, the specific scenario that he wrote this up, but the point is you, you can do these kinds of things, right? You can easily connect it to the WMI namespace, call the SMS boot image method, uh, go and create some WIM files, uh, rename it to WIM files, whatever it takes, generate uh, the boot image calling this uh, this method, and, and so on, export the boot image, whatever, right? So. Uh, may not ever need a script like this, but at least it's an example of things you can do with PowerShell. Notice that I'm not even really using any specific Config Manager commandlets here, uh, but it's just generic PowerShell being used and, and brought to bear against uh, a specific need to make it easier and, and more automated, right? And again, we could go on and on about the, uh, the options here, but those are a couple to suffice, right? All right, so um, the concept here, just to illustrate of, of the idea anyway, of parent and child task sequences. Well, you can tell from the, uh, the demos that, that I have here, there really is no such thing as a parent and child task sequence, but the concept is, is interesting. It's solid, right? So this is the automation concept that will pull in something like orchestrator. So maybe you have a task sequence, could be imaging, might not be imaging task sequence. You're going to see me use examples in a minute of non-imaging task sequences just for convenience. Where there's a portion of time in the task sequence that you would like to spin off a particular function to orchestrate. Or maybe, you know, whatever it is, sky's the Maybe it's adjusting something in AD. Maybe it's uh, making sure a, a particular setting is correct on uh, a, a domain controller before you move on. You know, whatever it is, right? Something that's better suited for orchestrator than a task sequence. You could maybe do it in the task sequence, but uh, it might be more appropriate to call into an orchestrator server that is uh, closer to wherever you're doing the action, you know, whatever it is, right? Uh, there are scenarios for it. And then once that orchestrator 
runbook finishes up, you want the task sequence to resume. Or you may just want the task sequence to hand off and just keep running anyway, right? Whatever the, the scenario is, that's what we're trying to illustrate. And so the best way to talk about it is really to just show uh, what it is that I'm talking about. So let me pull in my other lab where I have Orchestrator and walk through or talk through this by way of demo. So I've actually got two demo scenarios. I'm not going to do the third just because it gets a bit redundant. Uh, but the third is certainly a workable option where Orchestrator calls in and initiates maybe a task sequence or, or whatever. But we'll start here. So this is a task sequence that will call Orchestrator and then we'll finish up. So let me go edit this thing. So this is really simple. I, I know that these examples are very basic, but I hope they illustrate the point. So what I'm going to do is use the MDT execute runbook step. You don't have to use the MDT option if for some reason you don't want to. It's actually a very nice uh, option, but you could use something like the web service in Orchestrator. You could use SCO job runner, which is on CodePlex, uh, or whatever, right? This is what I chose here. In order to use this, I have to first uh, load in the toolkit package, make sure those files are downloaded uh, so that you know, certain scripts are available and, and uh, ready for use as a part of this process. So that will take a, just a little bit of time to download, and then this will run. And then basically, I'm handing off and telling Orchestrator, hey, go run this uh, thing called New Runbook. So if I browse, just to show you on the Orchestrator server, uh, this is the folder where my runbook is located, and this is called New Runbook. So that's what I, what I chose here. No parameters, although you could certainly specify parameters and pass them over if you had them or whatever. And then notice this last option, wait for the runbook to finish before continuing. So this is an interesting choice. Really what this choice is, is to say to the, uh, the task sequence, all right, I'm going to spin off to Orchestrator. And I want Orchestrator to finish and complete prior to continuing to process the task sequence. And that's fine. But what if the task sequence completes and doesn't actually get the job done that you were asking the task, I'm sorry, what if the runbook completes and doesn't actually get the job done that you were hoping the runbook would get done, right? Simply setting this flag to wait doesn't guarantee an outcome. So what I prefer to do is actually control what is going to happen based on output from the, from the runbook. So in my case, it's really simple. I'll show it to you in just a minute. But, you know, think about a runbook. You could actually have multiple branches inside a runbook and returning different, you know, uh, results, maybe registry entries or flag files or whatever, or text inside a flag file uh, based on the experience the runbook has had. Maybe it's a failure. Maybe it's a problem. Maybe it's a success, right? In my case, it's really simple. It's going to be a success. And then you could actually have logic in your task sequence that would respond accordingly, right? So in this case, I'm just handing off to the runbook. Runbook is going to start. So let's go over to the runbook server or the uh, escort server. And here it is. Very, very easy, right? All this is going to do is try to start a service. And then once it's done, it's going to write a file called tsorcts.txt. And that is going to be the indicator that the runbook has finished, right? Uh, again, if it... If I wanted to, I could put in logic here to write a certain flag file if it finished successfully, write a certain flag file if it finished with a problem condition, you know, write a certain flag file uh, to describe the process along the way, you know, whatever. The, the sky really is the limit. It's up to you how you design this thing. Um, the one thing I want to make sure of is that my flag file is not here because I think it is. Yep, it is. So I'll delete this and then we'll run uh, the process. So. Uh, once the runbook executes, so remember the task sequence is not waiting on the runbook to finish. I did not select that box. So while I call out to the runbook, the task sequence is moving on. I have to be, if I don't set that box to wait for the, the runbook, I have to be in charge of handling that. And so I do. And so the, right after the runbook kick, gets kicked off, I'm mapping a, a folder just for convenience. This is on my Scorch server. Because this is where that file should show up whenever the runbook is done. And then I simply launch a PowerShell script. It's not in a package. It's just on the root of my C drive. I just run a, launch a PowerShell script that's going to 
uh, have the job of monitoring. Right? Again, very, very simple, nothing complex here, although it could be fairly complex in, uh, in, in production environment scenarios, but not here. Font's too big for some reason. Uh, let's shrink this down. But, but the point of this really is that this is going to sit here in a loop. And it's going to pause one second every time it loops. And it's just going to keep checking this directory to see if this file has ever shown up. Right? Once it does, then I move on. And the task sequence step completes. And, uh, and, and I'm good. Right? So it goes without saying, again, that this is simple. It also goes without saying that there would need to be logical controls probably put in this uh, much more than what I'm doing right now, and probably some time out so that you don't just sit here and get into a loop and, and so on. But, again, the point here is just to illustrate the concept. So that said, let me go ahead and run this. So I actually have just a server here that I've already run these successfully on, but I'll run it. Here's the particular one that I've deployed. It's task sequence handing the orchestrator handing back to the task sequence, and I'm going to initiate this. Runs pretty quickly, I mean pretty pretty straightforwardly it does take a minute to run just because it has to download the MDT toolkit and you know so on and then it's gonna kick off uh, from there but we'll just watch it for a second so it's setting that up then it will hand off to orchestrator and let me if I can be fast enough let me see if I can should have had this before yeah so we'll monitor for that file to show up, the flag file. So it's just about, uh, should be just about to kick off the run book. And then we'll see the flag file, and then we'll see the PowerShell script detect the flag file, and then it's all done. Right, there we go. Executing run book. Run book is running. PowerShell script is running. That flag file uh, did show up. It just took a minute for it to refresh, but it was all very quick once it got going. All right. So I'll delete this again. So the next example is also equally simple. It's right here. Task sequence calling orchestrator, except this time orchestrator hands off to a child runbook of its own, and then it hands back to the task sequence. This is exactly the same scenario, but let me show you the difference in construction. So in terms of the task sequence, there is zero difference. It's the exact same task sequence, right? The only difference is which runbook I'm calling. So in this case, I'm calling a master runbook, but the rest of this is identical. It's looking for that same flag file, running that same PowerShell script, and so on. So if I go to my orchestrator server and go down to this runbook, I have a master runbook. Again, very easy. All this does is it kicks off and uses the invoke runbook command to call a child runbook, which is right here. Okay. And now all of the work that I care about is in the child runbook. So we'll run through this. Once it's done, we hand back control to master. Since there's nothing else to do, we end, right? But it's the concept that I'm trying to illustrate, which is you can build a mat just like you would in code. You can build a master runbook that would then uh, call child runbooks, much like you would have modular code and be able to, uh, to do things that way, right? Um, orchestrator allows you to do the same thing. So, so pretty simple concept. We'll run through this real quick and show the example. If I can get there, we go up here. So same exact kind of thing. Hopefully this one might run a little bit quicker. We, maybe not, but we'll see. Letting it run, downloading, and off we go. All right, give it a second, just monitor it for a minute, and then we'll, uh, oops, be done. Hang on a second. While this is running, I'm actually looking for something in my system tray. So I can, okay, there we go, that's what I was looking for. All right, so that uh, that ran and is done, and it did the exact same thing, and that kind of wraps up what I was trying to show with this particular demo. So hopefully illustrates uh, illustrates the concept. Let me pull the lab back out. All right, and this one again, it gets a bit redundant to just watch some 
demos like that, so I'll I'll move on. But um, all right. So the next ones really don't have demos here. I mean, I will show you a couple of things, but the really discussion topics as we kind of run this down and, and wrap up a bit. So one of the things that you can really get to, we've talked again about imaging and how it works and all of these things. What um, what the nirvana really could be of this is if we could get to the point where we deliver imaging basically as a service. So in the world today, uh, we hear all about you know different uh, items av as a service, uh, such as you know in Azure we have. Uh, software as a service, we have infrastructure as a service, we have platform as a service, all of those things. The point is, uh, we're in, in Azure and uh, you know, other you know, kind of competitors in that arena, we're providing a service that people can leverage to get the work done that they need to get done without having to worry about the infrastructure. Well, in a similar kind of mindset, we could uh, handle imaging as a service. And the idea there would be we simply just provide the infrastructure to allow teams around your business to do the job of imaging they need to do while leveraging the infrastructure that's been built. And so this is where I'll return to that uh, web page example. So let me pull uh, that up for a minute on my blog. This, again, is kind of a little bit of a, a legacy uh, it is legacy at this point example, uh, but it's illustrative of the of the issue. So the idea would be that we build a web page or an HTA or a SharePoint form or whatever you choose that has the different options available for imaging. And you control what they are. You control the popu what populates in these drop-down boxes, all these kinds of things. So you establish the framework. But now it's just essentially self-service imaging. It's a tool that field technicians can use, your own team can use, and whatever. And what this is doing is it's taking the input and plugging it into Config Manager where it's needed in order to get the job of imaging done. Right? And so if you scroll down a little bit on here, and, and you see this is VB code, scroll down a little bit on here, basically we're taking all the input, converting it into variables, which is one way to do it, and then the task sequence itself is very generic and works based on the input provided in that web page. So it could be that you have five machines that you're imaging, every single one of them run by the same exact task sequence, but every single one of them are built differently because the input given to the task sequence is different. Right? Now that's very powerful whenever you can get to that level of sophistication. Doesn't happen overnight, takes a while to get there, but once you can realize it, the results are pretty awesome, all right? All right, so that's one way to do it. <clears throat> and, you know, there are other ways. MDT has some really cool solutions uh, to be able to have a uh, configuration database, as an example, or uh, use custom settings I and I, or uh, use some of the UDI, user-driven initiative type stuff, which kind of gets away from the zero-touch power that you're probably wanting, but still, you can do those things, all right? All right, and then the final discussion. So this kind of is the pinnacle of building all of them. And again, we've we've kind of talked about it before. It's something that I've had on my blog for a little bit, but it, it still continues to serve the point of illustrating. And that's the idea that uh, that's the idea that after we've done all the work of building this really cool imaging solution, uh, very often it's viewed as only being applicable <clears throat> to physical hardware. It certainly is. Uh, and then, you know, when we have virtualized systems, that's kind of seen as being built by uh, VMware templates or Hyper-V templates or uh, VMM templates, if you will. Right? And certainly that works. And if you are sophisticated with your template build-out, you can do some pretty cool things. Generally speaking, what templates are used to do is build a system and then hand it off. Most of the scenarios that I run into, it's that simple. And so if you, if you separate your physical and virtual imaging needs, then you're essentially going to be building very likely duplication of effort in your processes. You'll also be taking about a 30-year uh, 
reverse in time in terms of imaging because using templates largely is very similar to a process we used to use very frequently called ghost, right? Where we uh, just put everything in the image and then we just keep laying that out over and over and over again. Well, if you spent the time to build a really cool solution for physical, why not apply it to both and let automation handle which one is going which way? And so that's why I put this particular blog entry together. I call it the sweet spot of imaging. The real uh, magic happens down here. And this is very, very basic. You would want to build it out more so if you were going to use something like this in production. But the idea is you maybe have that front page, that HTA, that web page or whatever, where folks can put in whether they're imaging virtual, imaging physical, or uh, what the parameters are for imaging. And then once that's submitted, it might feed into something like Service Manager or uh, feed directly into Orchestrator or however you do it. But at the end of the day, Orchestrator picks it all up and begins to work through the choices. And this right here, for example, is the decision place. If it's physical, it runs this way. If it's virtual, it runs this way, carves out a place on your host, and then it comes back together and the imaging process just starts completely automated the result is that the work that you've done, again, for physical, very easily applies in virtual as well. And one of the, one of the places where, and, and oftentimes, you know, maybe you think of uh, servers as being this kind of solution. It doesn't have to just be servers. Think of VDI, virtual device uh, infrastructure kind of arrangements. Those are workstations. And so uh, depending on the kind of VDI and the needs, this could be a very elegant solution there as well, right? So that's why I present it last, just kind of the pinnacle of the, the sophistication you can get to if you go down this automation pathway and, and really know your imaging process very, very well. So that said, we'll wrap up this session and uh, we have a couple more to finish out the series. So we will see you next time.